Hey guys, Rob here with McDojo Life. I just, uh, you know, I'd like to get started by saying thank you to my sponsors, Ground Shark Coffee and Diamond MMA. If it wasn't for those guys, I wouldn't be able to keep my lights on and do what I do for a living. So I appreciate that. Our guest today, Kyoko Shin Black Belt, uh, full contact world champion several times over, um, and martial arts legend Sam Greco. How's it going, man? Hey, really good, Rob. Thanks uh, for having me on. Yeah, man. Thank you for being on. Now, um, you know, over the years, you've had a pretty decorated career and, you know, I've looked over your, you know, obviously when I was growing up, um, at that time you were doing a lot of K one stuff. Um, but I didn't know you were a Kyoko Shin black belt. And then I looked through your resume and you have a, a very impressive pedigree from that. Um, but I guess the, the first question I really like to ask people is probably one of my favorite questions, but what made you want to start the martial arts? Look, uh, it wasn't for, for me as a youngster, it wasn't by choice. Um, you know, I had really strict parents and one of the biggest things with my parents was discipline. Um, and uh, I was a very rebellious kid growing up in the area that I grew up in. And um, dad sort of shared the same principles as martial arts. And that's why he got me involved at the age of seven. So that's where I started. But I must admit, I hated it because I had to follow rules for the first, you know, for the first two or three months. Um, and then after that, I must admit, I took a liking to it. I started enjoying the disciplinary factors, even though I was a young kid, um, and I was calling to go rather than to stay home. I, I really wanted to go. Yeah, man. Well, I, you know, I, th I noticed that a lot of kids start off that way, um, who are good anyway. You know, most kids who really enjoy it off the bat, like just to be honest, most of those kids usually don't stick around because they'd be good at anything that they do. And then they yeah. typically go off and do whatever it is that they want to do. But a lot of kids who have a hard time starting typically are the ones that usually stay with it for the longest. And, um, you know, you started when you were young, but when was the first uh, real match that you had? Well, the first real match that I had was at the age of 16. Um, you know, even though we're doing inter-club sparring at a very young age, but the, the, the competitive uh, uh, aspect was at the age of 16 when I started um, really kicking butt then. And I, I, I found a niche, you know, I, I found that traditionalism is what made me strong, you know, as a human being. It wasn't about me being strong, but about me being mentally strong. You know, and that's what I bring into this life today. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. You know, like um, you've been through some pretty, pretty crazy wars in the ring. And mm. I don't think that you would be able to for, for more or less do well in life, but especially in the ring, if you weren't didn't have a, a strong mental constitution. I mean, especially yeah. when there's another grown man whose only job in life is to kill you with his hands. <laughs> you know, yeah, you're, you're definitely right. Look, you know, when I, even when I joined K1, uh, K1's background is Sato Kaiken, which was a break away from Kyokushin, run by the great master Kazuyoshi Yushi. And his greatest plan was that strong karate fighters would be able to beat um, traditional uh, kickboxing guys. And um, that was his whole plan. And, um, you know, he, he got guys like myself and the great Andy Hug over there uh, to join. Um, and it became more on a professional basis. And, um, you know, we went on and, and won the world tournament in Sato Kaiken. And then our next. Uh, the next step was, hey, guys, how would you like to fight the kickboxers? And there was no such thing as uh, bringing us up nice and easy, you know, giving us easy fights. I mean, my first fight was the, the Japanese world champion, Sataki, and my second kickboxing fight was, you know, Peter Ertz, one of the greats, you know. So, <laughs> But his belief was that, you know, karate guys had the internal discipline and strength to take it on anyone in the world. And let me tell you, he was 100% right. You know, like – um. I don't know if how many people out there, like whenever we start talking about styles and stuff like that, I try to make sure that I explain because we, we have a lot of different martial artists that listen and they all have their own disciplines. But in case nobody is aware um, of Kyokushin, then I would suggest you look up Masoyama. And um, he has probably one of my favorite testings that there is. Uh, I, I do believe the legend that I've heard anyway, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is he did the 300 man Kumite which wasn't necessarily that he had 300 dudes there, but he did 300 matches. And then sometimes some of the guys cycled back through for the sparring, but Kyokushin is typically full contact from the neck down. You can um, punch as hard as you would like uh, uh, neck up. You're allowed to are from the waist up. You're allowed to kick. And I do believe you're allowed to kick to the legs as well in Kyokushin, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, and uh, so did you ever have to do that? Look, I, I remember even going for my, um, for my showdown, which was my first dan, and uh, you know, after a three and a half hour training session, you had forty fights straight after. 
that was a ritual. You know, that was there was no two ways about it. You had to go through it. And um, your first 20 fights were against guys that, that were actually doing the grading with you. And your next 20 were just 20 hungry wolves just waiting, black belts, you know, third, fourth degree black belts just waiting to come along and try to punch your head in. But it's uh, it's quite testing. And like I said to you, even though it was physically demanding, I think one of the greatest aspects, and I'm going to bring this up again, is you really need to have mental strength to get through because physically everyone breaks down. The best fighters in the world break down. But it's your mental strength through disciplinary stuff that you do from day to day through traditional martial arts is what takes you there, what allows you to take that next step forward and, and not give up, you know. That's why I love the association of being a fighter because for me being a fighter means not giving up, you know, at all costs. So, yeah. And you um you actually have followed through with that and outside of the ring now because you do motivational speaking and you have um I your your association as well uh, maybe you can tell some people about what you do now outside of the ring a little bit yeah look just carrying on I, I I've always had this thing in life that whatever I do I'd like it to carry on I never want anything really to stop and one of the greatest things like as i said to you through you know traditional karate and everything else is being able to implement stuff into life in general and not just for myself uh but for general people for friends and family and the general public and one of the things i sort of come up with was um the i'm a fighter campaign you know people often say yeah well that stands to reason sam you fight so why wouldn't you have a campaign called i'm a fighter but it really has not much to do with fighting itself the kicking and the punching but more so to do with the relevance of you know being a fighter, meaning not giving up, meaning fighting against adversities and fighting harder when the chips are down and so on. So I'm sort of implementing through my training and through training itself is implementing because there's a lot of individuals out there in this world that look physically strong but are mentally weak, you know, and vice versa. You know, never judge a book by its cover. I've had some of the biggest boys come to me and uh, physically strong, but you know, I just break them down mentally and I tend to work with those sort of people. People going through, you know, any form of um, uh, adversities in life, whether it be illness, you know, whether it be, you know, financial issues, whatever, you can relate to. My I'm a fighter campaign pretty much can relate to anything. You know, it's uh, basically teaching people to be resilient, you know, mm -hmm. like I was through the fight game is being resilient in life also, being able to get through things. Now, your record is pretty damn impressive. It's 144? Yeah. No, 144. 147 fights, but you know, let's let's not forget that's through um, you know different arts. Also, I went from you know 90 odd, 92 or 97 fights of full contact bare knuckle karate into kickboxing, you know, into MMA. Also, also wrestled, but I haven't added those wrestling uh, wrestling bouts in there either. But uh, it's extensive, but it's yeah, it's the whole circle of life. I believe it. I've done the whole circle of life of martial arts. You know? Yeah, I mean, you you have a really a really impressive career, and I, I also noticed that you did some acting. So how did that happen? Like, how do you go from punching people in the face to standing in front of a camera? I never understood like how quickly that happens. Yeah, look, the transition was there. The offer was there. It was just, it was funny. You know, I had a friend of mine who's uh, Richard Norton, who you're probably aware of. You know, one of Australia's great martial artists and um, American actors, um, Australian and American actors, and. Um, he offered me a part in 1993 in one of his movies here and I thought I'd take it up because of my martial arts background and um, from there I've never looked back and I've had agencies you know, looking at me and I've done so many, so many things, not just, um, you know, not just TV series but commercials and movies. I even started as Zarkos for kids out there who watch Scooby-Doo the movie. I play the main role <laughs> in that with Rowan Atkinson. So that was pretty cool getting on set with him for three months. But it's such a diversity, you know, in life, and I love being diverse because um, it enabled me to appreciate the entertainment aspect of of the fight game, if that makes sense, of what it's like to be an entertainer. Being a great fighter is one thing, but I think being a great entertainer is another, and uh, they got to work hand in hand. Yeah, man, I noticed that's where a lot of fighters' careers mess up. You know, there's some really, really talented fighters out there, but, you know, like at a certain level – every fighter there is talented. You know what I'm saying? Like you're dealing when you're dealing with a pool of like, let's say 75 to 80 middleweights or whatever. Right. And all those middleweights had to fight and claw and scrap their way to whatever the promotion is to be the top of their game. And um, what really seems to separate fighters is personality, to be honest, <laughs> like no one's going to give a damn who you are. If you can't entertain people, you're a hundred percent right. But I'm going to say this and I'm probably going to put my foot in this and, 
you know, we, we were talking about this the other day with a few friends sitting around a table over dinner, and one of the greatest things they say is being a great fighter is one thing, but you've got to be a great entertainer. At the end of the day, you know, the days have gone where people just want to see a great fighter. People want to see role models. People want to see mentors. People want to see people who entertain. You know, there's, you know, for example, the Conor McGregor, you know, he's, he's rated as one of the best fighters in the world. I wouldn't say he's number one, but what he's got going for him, he's a great entertainer, you know. There's people that'll pay money that love him to go and watch him fight, and then there's people that'll pay money to watch him get knocked out. At the end of the day, he's making money. doesn't matter which way you look at it. And that's why I say to people, I even say to my guys, don't worry about being the greatest fighter, but the greatest fighter in the world has to be a great entertainer. And you make money while you sleep. You know, uh, it, it's just one of those things. And people tend to neglect trainers are so embedded in this, you know, I've got to train, I've got to get this boy to train, but there's going to be a management side that really gets to them and says, hey, we need you to be a social, you know, a social role, a role model. You know, you've got to implement stuff in life. Don't just, I think it's more important what you do out of the ring than what you do in the ring. And mm. that's where people forget, you know. Um, but hey, I'll, I'll say it again, you know, you've got to make money while you sleep and that's why you've got to be a great entertainer. Yeah, that's interesting what you just said. I never even thought about that because I think a lot of people don't understand how much money it truly costs when you're first starting off in the fight game. Like you're not making any money. <laughs> I've been there. You're not you're not making any money and like you, you know, you're paying your dues and you have to pay your trainer and you have to pay your gym if you have a separate maybe if you have a dietitian, if you have issues with that, if you never wrestled, you might need that. Um, you know, you have to pay a lot of people, but you just added one to that list that I never thought about, which is like almost like an, a manager, like a management uh, figure in your life like that's very interesting thought yeah yeah look there's, there's only so much you can do as a fighter yourself i think you've got to be good and creative at one thing <clears throat> but then you've got to have certain you you can't do everything you can't be good at training and good at managing yourself and good at re you can't do all that you've got to have people in place you know they can they can uh, they can work those facets of of your career and my manager used to say to me son do what you're good at and pay people what you're bad at and you'll never go wrong. And by God, he was right. You know, he was so fucking right. You know, it's, it's, it's incredible. You know, that is and, great advice because, yeah, <laughs> you know, advice. I never met your dad, but that's exactly how I live my life because there's plenty of stuff I'm terrible at. <laughs> so I'm like, I don't know. I'll just pay this dude to do it, man. <laughs> but, but hey, that's that's exactly what you do. And that's how you become good at stuff. You know, some of the best entrepreneurs in the world. Do you think they go out and do it themselves? Do you think they cut their own lawns? Do you think they wash their own cars? Do you think they do all that? No, they get people to do it because their time is worth money. You know, how much is your time worth? Do what you're good at. Pay people what you're bad at. You never go wrong. Yes. That's amazing advice. I hope somebody <laughs> like anyone out there like heard that because that's really, really, really good. That's very insightful. Your dad's an insightful man. You had a fan here, Brandon Wynn. He said, gut puncher supreme. <laughs> so I guess he's a fan of your gut punches. Now, is that a particular go-to technique for you? You like hitting people in the body or the liver? Oh, look, I, I think one of the things um, that I found over the years is, you know, everyone loves, you know, a great knockout, whether it be a low kick or a head kick or whatever, but uh, there's nothing more embarrassing for someone to get hit with a body shot and dropping. And I've been on the receiving end. Peter Ertz caught me with a body shot twice. In, you know, in one round, I kept getting back up. You know, I've got that no-die aspect, but I do it at, I do it at training to people and um, in fights. I, I prefer to knock someone out with a body shot than a head shot sometimes. Yeah, the funny really thing about good. a liver shot, if anybody's never been hit with a liver shot, is it usually has like a little bit of a delayed effect because okay. I remember I've been rocked with liver shots and they all feel the same. You get hit and then you're like, oh, I'll be all right. You take that first step and your body just collapses and you're on the ground like, I think something's broken. <laughs> you're right, 100% right. And there's nothing nothing worse than curled up on the ground trying to look for that breath that you can't find. <laughs> I, those are some of my personal favorite shots. Like, uh, I don't know if you're a fan of Raymond Daniels or not, but Raymond Daniels is the king of sneaky body shots, especially with that lead leg sidekick or spinning sidekick. It sneaks yeah. and drops people cold. It's crazy. Man. So, you know, you've been in the fight game for a long time. So who were some of you, who were some of the guys that when you were coming up through the ranks that you were really looking up to or some of the fighters that you like now? Look, you know, it was quite interesting when I, when I first started uh, kickboxing after I won the world title in, um, in full contact karate in Japan and I started fighting kickboxing. I mean, I had no idea who Peter Ertz and Ernesto Hoost, Mr. Oh. Perfect guys were. And well, I was sort of thrown into the deep end, but nevertheless, through just the karate, having the karate spirit itself, and that's what we relied on, 
uh, besides the technique. Um, I was happy to take on these guys. I thought I'm in this sport for a good time, not a long time. You know, <laughs> let's do this. If I don't fight them today, I'm going to eventually fight them anyway. And I'm so glad I fought them at a very young age and got through it. And not only did I fight those type of guys, you know, the race surfers of the world once, twice, I fought them three times also. So, you know, I've left no stone unturned. I fought the best fighters in the world with minimal experience and beaten them and have been beaten by them. Um, you know what? And my wins and, and, and losses, they're all at the same level. I don't, I don't treat a loss as a loss complete. It's more of a learning curve than a loss. You know, either win or learn. That's the two things that I do in life. But, you know, even from there, going on to K1 said to me after that, they, had, they come up with another plan. They said, who would like to do MMA? You know, so they offered their boys, the K1 fighters of the world, the uh, MMA fights, you know, because pride was around at the time in Japan. And uh, I was the first guy to put my hand up and said, hey, I'll try it as long as you can get me the best Brazilian trainers in the world out to Japan to train me full time. I'm, I'm there. And that's exactly what I did. Who you was know, your, took who your trainers for your MMA fights? Who was training you then? I had a Brazilian guy. Um, oh, my God. His name's just slipped my mind. He's actually passed away. They passed away uh, a few years ago now, about six years ago. Uh, Marco Jara, um, his name was. Uh, that's who I trained with. And also then I trained back in Japan with a lot of the Japanese guys. But, um, you know, I fought the likes of Heath Herring and beat Heath Herring. I fought Leota Machida, went the distance with Leota Machida with no experience, so to speak. Went the distance. I thought I still won that fight. It's on YouTube. But, you know, we could never get a rematch because he knew I was going to be dangerous the second time around. But, um, you know, guys like that that I take on, you know, who are the best in the world. That's what makes me who I am today. You know, I'm not, I wasn't, you know, uh, uh, excuse the French, uh, one of my fighters say, you know, we're not here to fuck spiders and that's the truth. You know, basically, you know, I want to get out there and fight the best in the world. I, I want to test myself at all times. And that's exactly what I did. You know? So, you know, like, um, I got. I actually have several questions. Like, uh, it's it's very interesting because you have a, a very extensive pedigree in fighting. And I, to me, I've always, I've always had, I've been under the impression that there is no more honest moment that you're going to have with yourself or another human being than when you're actually fighting them. Um, and that's, um, I don't think that a lot of people will probably, if they've never fought somebody full contact, they probably won't get that reference, but it's an experience that I think everybody should have at least once to know themselves better is you need to fight somebody like really fight them. Like, Fist to cuffs, like get down, fight them because you realize what you're made of. You realize what other people are made of that you might not have necessarily given them credit for. Um, you realize like if you've lied to yourself at all, <laughs> you usually find out in the ring like, yeah, my diet's fine. My cardio will be OK. And you get out there you're like, fuck, cheeseburgers suck so bad, you know. <laughs> um, but then, um, you know, one thing that affected me in a big way. Um, in my life anyway, one was starting martial arts. It changed my, my, my whole outlook on life. But, um, the other thing was my first loss because I went from the time I was 12 years old until the time I was 18 years old without a real loss. Um, and so I got an ego, you know, I had a pretty big ego at the time and I loved, um, fighting. I thought it was I, not outside of the ring. I wasn't just fighting random people, but in cages are not in cages, but in rings, uh, sport karate stuff kickboxing stuff, boxing stuff. I just wanted to fight. Um, and then I took my first loss and it's probably like one of the hardest moments of my life. If I remember, <laughs> because I remember thinking that this was something that I was going to go through and be like the greatest in the world at, and this is going to be my career. And I remember, um, first round bell rings, we touched gloves. Um, he backs up. I can tell he's scared because I think I, my, um, confidence, had scared him. Honestly, I don't think he had a reason to be scared because he was, he was actually okay. Um, but I think just the bravado got to him and uh, we touched gloves. And as soon as we started, I came off the gate with a right cross and hit him hard flush right in the face. And, um, it scared him and he turned his back and he started walking away towards the ring rope. And I was like, Okay, so I just chased him and I hit him with a left hook. And then when he went to go turn around again, he I could see he look he looked me right in the eye and he threw up a kick and it hit me right in my liver and dropped me. Bow. And um, I remember I just I was pe I peeled myself off the canvas, but I didn't make it up in time. And it was over. And it was like I was winning. Everything was going well. And then I crumbled. And I remember that was probably the first time ever. In my adult life, I had cried and I cried like a grown, like a fucking baby. I couldn't help, I couldn't help it. Like my whole, like, it was almost like my whole belief structure, like 
got taken from me, you know, all the ego and the bravado. And I think it was the best thing in the life in the world for me. I think that loss was huge. It was good. It's what you need. Now you have a few losses, but you know, is there like a loss that sticks out to you? That was like a changer for you or like really helped you grow. Can, can I say this? You know, I, 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 there's, no, there's no particular loss that's, that's been a word for or better than one another. I've got to say this. I try to walk in the ring with no regrets. So in other words, I do all my homework before I step in there. There's nothing worse than working, walking into a ring, knowing that you've missed part of your diet or missed part of your training. You know, there's nothing worse than that. that to me, that's defeat before you even start. So I'd like to walk in, leaving no stone unturned. And if I'm going to get beaten, get beaten by a badass motherfucker <laughs> and beaten properly. And at least I can go away and learn. But to, to not give it 100%, and walk in there and get beaten. I didn't get beaten by a badass motherfucker. I can beat myself. That's exactly what I've done. So I always play, I always put things in perspective there um, at all times. So, you know, um, is there is there one particular loss? No, look, they, they pretty much, you know, my losses for those, the ones that I've had, serve a reason, you know, um, and I've always been beaten by a better guy. You know, there, there's, been, there's been times, and I, I must admit, there's been times where, you know, Everything has just gone right. The conference is booming and everything else. It's exactly like you. I fought a Brazilian, Francesco Filio, in kickboxing. Um, and I caught him with an overhand right. I went to go left uppercut. As he just bounced against the ropes, he was literally in the, in the first round. He's caught me with a right hook, but the right hook's just hit my temple. Now, when you look at it, it doesn't look heavy. It doesn't look like a heavy punch, but it just dropped me. Now, K1 at that particular time, instead of an eight count, they made it a five count because it was a tournament. So I was standing by five, but I was, you know, a bit, bit, bit wavy, and that was a loss, you know. And I thought to myself, wow, even though things were so perfect for me, you can get caught. But hey, that's the fight game, you know. They're, they're, that's that's just life. That's the way you got to take it. We prepare ourselves for war. I mean, let me ask you this. I mean, in terms, you know, in terms of getting ready for a fight. You do everything. You do everything. Like I said, you leave no stain unturned. You you want to know that you've you, you basically walked in and you've lived that warrior's life, you know, that, that samurai life before you even step in there. Now, whatever it may be, once you get in there, let it be. But I, I'm not going to take, I'm not going to say, shit, I should have done, you know, more sprints and I should have done, you know, I, I should have had a better better diet leading up to this. They're regrets. They're, they're, they're absolutely losses before you even step in the ring, you know. And they're the things that I, I wouldn't be able to live with. I want to know that I've given it everything I've got and uh, I got beaten by a better person because I can always go back, review it, and learn from it. You know, I've never treated it as a loss as being down and down in the dumps ever. You know, sure, no one likes to lose, but guess what? It's a fucking part of life, and that's all there is to it. And it makes you a greater man at the end of the day if you know how to, you know, if you know how to treat it. Yeah, definitely, man, definitely. Now, somebody, somebody chimed in here. Brett said something. Let's see what Brett has to say. So. Hold on, I'll throw his, his comment up on the screen. He said, when I was younger, I was lucky enough to have Sam in my corner and a Kyokushin ring fight. The most memorable thing was in between the rounds, Sam held my hair to talk to me. I, I really listened, and I really listened as I was more scared of Sam than my opponent. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got something the fact right now, but uh, Brett, for whatever it's worth, I, I hope you're doing well right now, you know? <laughs> that's funny <laughs> that's always yeah, nice <laughs> i mean when you have somebody in your corner who you just like i think that always i mean personally i think that always helps when you like you know i never i never took the weight of anybody with me in the ring because it was all just me at that point but I, it's always nice when you go and you know you have somebody in your corner who is going to give you something legitimate to take with you back into the ring for the next round. You know, like, ah, I always hated the guys in the corners who were like, good job. Just keep doing what you're doing. Like, I lost the round. Like, why are you telling me good job? I, I, I tell you, I tell you what, you, you're going to probably hate me for this. But I remember, you know, Ronda Rousey um, fighting here in Australia and um when she got beaten by Holly Holmes, she got knocked out oh, by yeah. Holly Holmes. You know, and one of the big, biggest things I criticise, and it's it's constructive criticism because I always say how to tell you how to fix it, is her, Ronda Rousey's trainer giving her advice after the first round. 
she got absolutely demoralised in the first round. She got punched out in the first round. He's, she's come back to the corner and he's he's going, keep it up. You're doing a great job. How the fuck are you doing a great job when you're not moving to your fucking left? You're moving the opposite way. You're giving her the worst advice in the world. You know, you don't have to be an Einstein to work that shit out. And that's, I think, sometimes I get caught up in this, this whole, fuck that shit, man. <laughs> you know, you, your girl or guy's fighting and, you know, you've got to be the saviour. You've got to give them instructions. You've got to tell them how to peel themselves out, you know. And if they're not, do the right thing, throw the fucking towel in and save them to live another day, you know. The fight game's fucking dangerous. Simple, you know. And that yeah, sort of advice that actually realize, made me realise, even at the highest level, you've got some trainers being egotistical idiots, you know, giving the wrong advice, absolute wrong advice, you know. And it's dangerous on the yeah. fighter itself. Yeah, I, I never understood that. Like, it always, it's all, it just baffles my mind because, you know, just, I don't care if I'm doing like, in, in, in any case, I don't care if I'm doing everything perfect. The job is to give the advice. <laughs> like, nothing's perfect. There's always something that could be done better. So even if you're doing well, like, you still, like, you know who I really enjoy uh, listening to in the corners is um, uh, Jackson Winklejohn's camp. Yeah, because yeah. they are so good at at already having a game plan of who gets to speak when. He never raises his voice. He's always very calm. No matter if the fighter's losing, winning, doesn't matter. He has the same monotone level voice. He always gives very clear, decisive instructions. And more importantly, he asks for feedback in return. He goes, do you understand what I said? He'll say things like, is that clear? You know, and he's like, are we good? Like all of these things, he's getting that feedback to make sure that his fighter is still all there. You know, that's that's a beautiful thing to me. I, I don't know about you, but that's something I really enjoy listening to. No, no, look, I, I, I've taken advice from that too, even with my guys when I take when I bring them back in the corner, you know, after the, each round. First thing I do is, is I ask them to breathe. Uh, is everything okay? I, I want their feedback straight away. And then, you know, within 30 seconds, I can deliver a message now. The worst thing for a trainer to do is try and deliver something complicated. Make it simplistic. You've trained. You know your stuff. You know, you call your codes and just listen to them. And, and, and sometimes you see fighters that are frustrated sitting on the seat. And meanwhile, you've got the trainer still giving them instructions. Hey, you've got to cut that shit. The more information you put into someone who's frustrated, the worse it's going to be. Make it simplistic. Go back to your basics. Your basics are going to get you out of trouble. Simple as that. All, comp all, you know, all these fancy techniques are all based on a basic. So go back to it if you have to. <laughs> Simple, you know. Um, and that's the best way for, for me to give instructions to my guy. And like I said, it's all about his well-being. I want to make sure he's all right. And, you know, physically and mentally because they go both hand in hand. So it's really important how you give the, the, the instruction. But, you know, I hear what you're saying about Jackson. Um, and I'm, I'm, I tend to be the same. You know, some, sometimes overload of information is no good and not enough is no good. You've got to find that happy medium you know, that your fighter rel relates to you straight away. Yeah, and, you're, and your fighter, you already know your fighter. You already know what they respond to well, especially since probably during their training camps, you've already broken them. You already know where they where they fall, what is their triggers and things like that. So, mm. um, you know, but I don't, it, the opposite can be said about being good at your training too. Is like, I, I don't know if you ever watched uh, Mighty Mouse or if you're a fan of Dimitri's or, or not, but uh. He has, a, he has a very cool, like, concept, and I agree with it 100%, which is, like, he talks about, like, basically fighting as if you had, like, a multiple colors in your palette, you know? So, like, if you're only painting with just your primary colors, well, that's very easy for the other fighter to pick up on. But if you're painting with all these different techniques, it's very difficult to read, which is true. You know, and like you said, like, every advanced technique is, a, is based off of a basic, you know, like... Um, so it's hard, like when you're fighting somebody and you look across the ring and they're coming at you with like 50,000 techniques and you're like, what happened to jab cross? Like, are we not, are we not going to do that? We did that so much. <laughs> like, <laughs> Hey, tell me, I'm going to ask you something, Rob. And I, I often ask this to people. Isn't it interesting? People ask me what it's like to fight. And I said, do you know, you could spend 200 hours getting ready for a fight. You can spend a camp of, you know, eight, eight to 12 weeks getting ready for a fight, you know, say 200 hours of training for a fight that could last 10 seconds, a fight that could last 15 or 20 minutes, irrespective. And uh, isn't it interesting that you often get people that sit there, and I mean, these, I'm calling these armchair specialists that sit there in the crowd and, you know, Sam Greco goes in and knocks the guy out in 10 seconds. They go, oh, geez, that was easy. But no one actually realises the amount of time and effort 
that's actually gone in for that so-called 10 second fight. And if it goes the distance and it's technical, they go, yeah, look, it was a great fight. But if one motherfucker gets knocked out in 10 seconds, people go, oh, what a fucking great knockout. So everyone dismisses how good the fight was. It was just, just a knockout. We're, as a crowd, I think as, as, as fans, we're when we're our own minds, you know, love, we love to see knockouts. You know, you could have a, for example, a UFC show that's got, um, yeah, with the prelims in the main card, it probably got, say, 10 fights. Nine are technically sound that go the distance, magnificent. And then there's that one fight that's a brutal knockout. What do people remember? They remember that <laughs> knockout. It's fucking brutal. See, I hate You know what's crazy to me? It. It's like, I saw, um, did you watch the uh, the Israel um, fight? Uh, yeah, Israel had, Anderson Silva? Yeah, I had my boy fighting on the same night. Yeah, yeah, did yeah. You, I know you were there. Hmm. Um, but that fight to me was beautiful. I, I personally was like on the edge of my seat. My, my hands were sweating. Because they were, they're so technically good, you know, and they have so many bags of tricks in there that, you know, as a, when I watch fights, I try to read them. You know, I'm like, oh, he's getting ready to throw the head kick. He's setting it up with the body shot. Wait for it. Uh, but I couldn't. There, I'm like sitting there looking at it. And it was almost like looking at high level calculus. I'm like, I have no clue what the hell he's about to do. And then it'd be something crazy. I was like, oh, my God, that's the coolest thing ever. <laughs> you know, but like, what did you think about that fight? Did you enjoy the fight? <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I predicted that fight from the word go. I know Anders, I've known Anderson for years. I've know I know Israel the Adesani for years. Also, both are technically sound. I mean, they're the greatest chess players in their in their division. You know, um, and that's what it was. It was a chess game. It's about me making you make a mistake and checkmate. And you know, again, you know, there'll be people out there, skeptics who said, "Ah, oh, man, fucking, it was nothing. It was just pretty much touch for touch." But I think you really got to appreciate what these guys are about. You know, I'd love that guy saying whatever he said to go and stand in front of his role and see what it's like to stand in front of him, you know, and get picked off by him. You know, you think he's going one area, he's going, but he's going somewhere else. It's the same as Anderson Silva. Those guys have fought the best fighters in the world and pretty much dismissed some of the best fighters in the world, if that makes sense, you know, by knocking them out, you know, by front kicks and, and so on. So... You know they've got they've got techniques that I think the average person would love to have or at least have some of, and these guys are just masters at what they do. I call them gods. You know they're gods at what they do. And you know if Anderson Silva walked away tomorrow, to me he's one of the greats. You know he is yeah. one of the greats. You know, he, he's Israel Adesani, you know, good friend of mine too. He's one of the greats, and he's probably is the up and coming. You know Anderson Silva, but I, I, the thing that Adesani's got going for him. He's fucking charismatic. He's an entertainer, man. He can dance. He can do. He can do all that. He he basically makes Anders and Silver look average when he gets going, and I don't mean that disrespectfully either. Yeah, you know? oh, not in the ring. You know, obviously not in the ring. You just meant like personality. Yeah, yeah. Speaking, yeah as a, from an entertainment aspect, you know, he's yeah. a guy who's got everything. He's got, he's got, uh, he's got not only what Anderson's got, but he's got that entertainment aspect. You know, yeah. he knows how to play that crowd. I think Brendan Sharp called it it. You know, he's got that it factor. You can't really be taught it. You can't really train it. You just either are or you are not that personality type. And he, I mean, he's an entertaining dude, man. That's that's the kind of fights people want to see. You want to see something. You want to be entertained. That's what we're doing, you know? Did you hear, did you hear Brendan Bendis Rob's uh, interview when he when they asked him about uh, what he thought about the fight? And he thought, oh, God, you know, young bull versus old bull. He says, the way I'd like to see this go is, you know, that, you know, he's, He's, uh, sorry, Silver's 44 years of age. You know, Adesanya's a very young boy in his 20s. He goes, the best way he could work out is Adesanya just kicks him in the fucking head and just knocks his head <laughs> off. And yes. He can come back. I know it's hard to, hard to accept, but I can understand what Brian, you know, Brendan's uh, saying, you know. It's hard to accept, but he's right. Well, hey, like, I think, what is that? Like um, an honorable death, I guess you could say. It's, it's oh, going God. out like a fucking <laughs> boss. You know, you went in. You knew you was like it, it, a lot of people like to forget, but Muhammad Ali had quite a few losses at the end of his career, you know, mm -hmm. because he got old. Like it gets everybody. You, eventually, things don't work the way they did. You know, it's very impressive to make it in the fight game to be that age. I mean, I'm impressive as shit to me. You know, it's because so many guys are retiring early thirties. You know, they're done. Like their whole entire life had been fighting up to that point. But if somebody like that like goes in on his horse. 
I mean, he wants to be carried out on his shield. You know, he he doesn't want to go out like a bitch. He wants to, like, I got to say, he probably wants that. He welcomes that fight, that one last brutal fight. And then just to be, to look in the mirror and go, you know what? Now I'm happy. I'm done. It's There's no question. Because how bad would it suck to be left with a what if? You know, how bad would that suck as a fighter? <laughs> You couldn't live with it. It's 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 quite demoralising. You know, trying trying to live with the what if in life and trying to answer it every single day of your life, it'll, it'll fucking traumatise you. That's what it would. And I think you know, Brendan, as as harsh as it sounded, I think he was right in what he's saying. I don't think he said it disrespectfully, but outright he hit the nail on the head, and that's probably the way it should have finished. Who knows where we're going to see Anderson next? You know, whether he's going to fight next another time, I don't know. Um, yeah, who knows? I mean, we've got Robert, Rob, poor Robert Whitaker, you know, fell ill just literally the night before the event. It's fucking that unbelievable. Sucks. I was with him on the Friday, working out with him on the Friday in the same room, and he looked the sharp as fuck. Oh, my God, he's super, super sharp, and I think it would have been an awesome fight with him and Kelvin. But <laughs> we never- The only thing that got me was Gastelum had that belt. He was walking around with the belt on like, you did. His belt. <laughs> it was Henry's. She did his <laughs> belt. It wasn't like, even his. Yeah. yeah, and he goes, mate, put that fucking belt down. He goes, get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> what would you predict out of uh, Adesani and uh, and uh, Kelvin? Oh, uh, if Israel? Oh, Israel yeah. all day. Israel all day. Like you know, the thing about Kelvin is, is like, I think for a little bit of time there, he was like a sleeper. You know, he's like a sleeper fighter. You know, like you wouldn't probably pay him much attention. Like. You know, probably wasn't doing. I think what he's starting to do now, he's trying to build a personality so he can have a longer career. That's just my opinion. Yeah, I, this is an outsider's point of view. Um, kudos to him if he's he able to make it work because I think that's what that whole stunt thing was about. You know, like mm-hmm. or the belt thing was about. Like that he was just trying to like have people say his name. Basically, of course. Of course. So he he walked around the whole fucking stadium with the belt. Yeah. But I don't, I don't was, foresee because Kelvin would have to take Israel down if he was going to beat him. In my opinion, um, I don't think he has the the toolbox to be able to do so. I, in my opinion, I don't think he'd be able to take Israel down. I don't think that he has that timing. I don't think he has that footwork to be able to do so. He damn sure can't stand and trade with Israel. Um, not too many people can. Um, so I don't. I, 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 in my opinion, I saw. I foresee Israel taking that all the way. Yeah. Look, I, I tend to agree with you, even though you know. I admire Kelvin for what he's done. I think he's got a great wrestling ba- base and everything else. Uh, his stand ups, his stand ups, pretty good. But I think from arm's length away, Israel will pick you off like a bitch straight up. He, he's relentless. He, in fact, he mocks you while he does it. That's that's the thing with Israel. He'll laugh at you. You know, he walks one way to go another way. He's um, the misdirection with that kid is unbelievable. He's I've seen him train. I've trained beside him. He's he's um, yeah, he's he's one one in a box. Let me tell you, the Robert Whitaker, Robert Whitaker um, Israel fight, if that ever happened, would be quite interesting. I, I actually would like to see that. You know who I'd really like to see though? I, I I don't I don't know if I'll ever get it in my lifetime, but these two guys would be an amazing fight. Is Michael Page versus Israel? The Venom. Yes, man. Because they're both like because Michael Page has got that karate stylist thing where he's got that timing, distance management. He's got uh, good footwork. Um, you know, he's, he's really hard to catch. He will hit you first. I promise you that. Um, and Israel has got that Anderson Silva style of being able to have all these multiple tools in his toolbox. Um, it would just be a beautiful fight. I, I, I think it would, somebody probably get knocked out. <laughs> yeah. 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 Look, Venom, Venom is definitely, um, one of a kind also. He has the, the, those, those likes of the, yeah, the Anderson Silva and, um, and Israel. So there's another one in the box, but um, who knows? That that would be a great fight. I mean, they Some just t- recently started trading, so yeah, yeah. Could happen. He, Could yeah. Happen. Isn't he fight? Is he? Did he fight last week? Was he fighting this week? Who? Michael Page? Yeah, Page. Shit, Is I he? don't know. I don't know. That's a good question. I thought I thought he might have been fighting. I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Oh. Somebody has a question for you. So they wanted to know, um, what was it like fighting Michael Thompson? Oh, God, Michael Thompson, it was interesting. I fought him in the uh, fourth world tournament in Japan. 
Um, and uh, I hit him with a with a right hook, but bounced off his shoulder and hit him in the chin. So I got a point deducted against me. Um, yeah, mind you, the World Tournament's a 250 man fight over three days, last man standing. I was into the second day already, and uh, unfortunately, with only 30 odd seconds to go, you know, I couldn't drop Michael after that to win the fight. So they end up giving the Michael the uh, the uh, the fight, and that sort of. Uh, was stuck right here in my throat after <laughs> after that loss. Um, and I thought to myself, you know, Michael being one of the best, you know, full contact karate fighters in the world out of the UK, I said, I've got his number. I know I can beat this guy. I know I can beat this guy. And I ended up meeting him in the final of um, the Karate World Cup in Japan in 1994. It was a, it was a, um, I ended up having five fights that day. He was my fifth fight in the final. Uh, but I ended up knocking him down, hitting him with a body shot. Good old yeah, body shot. <laughs> yeah. And what was it like fighting? Look, Michael's a very, very good friend. I'm very classy. He had one of the most lethal back spinning kicks um, ever. I've seen him rupture spleens with back spinning kicks. You know, he, he hit uh, Chum Po, one of the Thai world champions at the time, with a back spinning. He just ruptured his spleen, left him lying there on the ground. They had to escort him off to hospital. Um, he had a huge back spinning kick to the head, also. I was fortunate enough never to be caught by any of those because I used to close the distance on them very early. <laughs> I basically wanted to chew on that. That's what I wanted to do. That's why so, you got to do your homework. <laughs> yeah, right, you're 100. percent But no, it was an honour fighting him. But I don't know what he's doing right now. He's probably back in the UK teaching. I'm not really sure. Right. And then uh, right. we got a couple more questions. Yeah. Uh, George. Yeah. He lucky. said, yeah. he said uh, K1 uh, days backstage setup versus current UFC setup. What's the difference? You know what? I've been in both elements. Um, I'm currently in the UFC at the moment, you know, because I've got boys. Um, look, the organization side of it, the UFC are second to none. They're, they're pretty much on the ball. They've got so much happening. Um, but you know what? Looking back, K1 was ahead of its time. You know, back in the 90s when it first started, 93, when I joined them in 93, 94, you know, right up to the mid-2000s, um, we were ahead of our time. Even the money we were making was was even more than what the UFC was making. You know, the only the top five to ten percent are making the big dollars today in the UFC. So we were ahead of our time. I think the Japanese had it right. You know, it's funny because like the you know, to me the Japanese organizations from an outsider point of view, because I've never been to the backstage or the underbelly of those particular organizations like the K1s or the Prides or anything like that. But it seems like the one that I'm not quite understanding right now is Risen. Um, what I've noticed is like, you know, with, with a fighter like such as Gabby Garcia, who, you know, in jujitsu already claimed her legendary status. So she, she could retire tomorrow and still be a jujitsu legend. Um, but you know, they give her from what I've seen, like just these awful, awful fights. And it's almost like it's that culture. Like maybe it's just because that's what people are entertained by. I'm not sure. Well, but uh, you know, look at the size of it girl and i mean strong as there is no there is no one in that vicinity that would be able to fight her that's actually her size unless she fights one of the guys and i mean that's not being disrespectful but she's she's one in the box she's just she's just a really really big girl you know and yeah I mean, what is she 210 or something yeah, like that yeah she's just a massive girl man and you know what the thing is with the japanese they will put up one of their own against her because that's the whole samurai warrior way. That's what they do. That's what the Japanese, you know, are about. They're not afraid to step back. You know, but they will feed one of their rows to the lines. That's the thing. <laughs> they will. Because, <laughs> yeah. you know, dude, I remember there was a fight. I don't remember. I really wish I knew that other fighter's name. And they were at the weigh-ins, and I looked at the, the size difference, and I was like, there is no damn way that they are stepping in that ring at the same size. There is no way. We're talking probably at least the 35, 40 pound weight difference, at least. And I'm being very polite. And, um, and again, like, I, you know, like you said, I don't have any disrespect towards Gabby Garcia. I don't think that it's up to her. There are matchmakers who do that job. That's not her job. Her job is to fight, you know, and it doesn't matter who steps in front. You fight whoever they tell you to fight whenever you tell them to fight, because damn it, that's what you do. Um, but man, this lady, she came out, and I think that maybe they misinformed her or some shit because as soon as it came out, they touched gloves. She bounced off two ring ropes 
before actually setting up with Gabby. And as soon as she like bounced off the second ring rope, she got hit and it looked like she was scared shitless. Like she didn't know where the hell she's like, this isn't where we sell Girl Scout cookies. And then all of a sudden was just dominated. It was, it was crazy to me. <laughs> let, me let me tell you, I'd be shit scared of Gabby too if I stepped in the ring. She's a monster <laughs> yeah. of a person. I love her to death, but she's a monster of a person. I mean, hey, talking about big guys, you know, I, I'm the one who's actually, you know, who introduced Bob Sapp. Do you remember Bob Sapp? Jesus, yes. Bob Sapp, like yeah, what? Bob to uh, seventy-five. Yeah. yeah, he was well in Australian kilo. He was one hundred and eighty kilo. He was one hundred and eighty kilo, which is whatever it was in pounds. But I'm the one who's responsible for for introducing him to K One. We used to wrestle together at WCW, and when the company went belly up, I took him over to Vegas and introduced him to K One, and. Bob is a very good entertainer, and I knew straight away that that kid would make money. But what I didn't realize is he was just a lazy fuck. He hated training, um, but when he did train, the prick was actually quite a good, quite a quite you know a talented boy. And um, I was his coach for a while, and then the Japanese took over, and then they rang me up. They said we can't deal with him anymore. You got to come back. So I did go back. But um, <laughs> You know, here's, here's a guy, strength-wise, oh, my God, I can't even tell you how strong that, that guy was. If only he trained and put in the work, let me tell you, that guy could have been anything, you know. But now chooses just to live the circuit of just going around and getting bowled over by people, getting paid for it. I couldn't live with that. You know, I thought he'd have a bit more sense than that, but obviously money's got the better of him and he just goes around getting knocked out left, right and centre, which is quite yes. sad from a guy, yeah. you know, who's had everything. Because he fought Crow Cop, if I remember correctly. He, he, fought, he did fight Crow Cop. Crow Cop ended up, I think, breaking his uh, orbital. Yeah, I think he, he hit him hard. Left yeah. yeah, he hit him damn hard. I remember I remember that fight. Oh, 396 pounds? There you go. He's 100. That's right. That's exactly right. He's, he's, I rolled with him. I used to wrestle with him. He's a fucking monster. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> God damn. Dude, that, um, you know... Kudos to him for being a functional human being in that way. He was never fat. He was lean. Yeah. He's, I guess, what is that, genetics? Call it, call it whatever you want. God call it whatever man. you want. Thank God you know, USADA went around. Thank God you USADA went around at that time. Otherwise, you'd be gone. <laughs> what, is, what do you mean he's on the juice? Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I watched this thing. Uh, do you remember the movie The Longest Yard? Yes, he was on yeah, that. He yeah. Was in that movie. yeah. And um, they I remember watching like a director's outtake or a cut or whatever, the behind the scenes thing, and they were talking about how much these people would eat. And they were talking about one of the dudes for lunch would eat four whole chickens a oh, day. God. Is that um is that the Indian guy? The, the yeah, the uh, big, was... big, big guy. Yeah, with a big jaw. What's his name? Radeep? Radeep or something? He used to wrestle also. Yeah, he was a wrestler, but that he would eat four whole chickens every lunch. Like, Humble. and, you know, if you look at the dude, like, he's framed that way. Like, his body is that big. Like, he has to eat that shit to survive. That's probably, like, his minimum calorie count to live, <laughs> you know? But then I look at somebody like Bob Sapp. You know, Bob Sapp. 396 pounds like and and again like you said he's not a he was not a fat man he's he's very strong dude like i can't imagine like how many calories he'd have to eat to maintain that frame i spent many many years with him and uh, really really um i tell you what he could eat let me tell you he could eat sometimes sometimes you know, his, his, his mind was hungrier than his stomach and he used to overorder. But at the end of the day, he'd eat. He'd eat me, he'd eat me at a house and home, let me tell you. <laughs> you know, how bad would that suck? Y'all are all hanging around after a training camp. You got your lightweight guy sitting next to Bob Sapp. Everybody's hanging out. And then the lightweight guy disappears. And then all you see is a shoelace getting sucked into Bob Sapp's lip. Like, <laughs> damn it, you ate another one. We're running out of lightweights, God damn it! You got to stop this. <laughs> yeah, he... Um, <laughs> We, we wrestled in Japan together um, with the great Muta um, and uh, not uh, George Allen. It was a great, we did a four way. It was myself, Bob Sapp, the great Muta, and um, Abdul the Butcher versus um, the American crew, D. Lay Brown, and a few others. 
So uh, we wrestled together over there, and uh, oh my God, Bob's a big man, let me tell you. Big man and strong. Don't underestimate yeah. his strength. The guy was just a freak, absolute freak. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, you know, we got about 15 minutes left, but I always like to ask this question. Um, it's, it, it, I told you before, I have two questions I like to ask people. One, why did you start martial arts? Um, which yours is very simple. Like you didn't have a choice. Like you're going ready, go. Um, but, uh, one thing that a lot of people don't really are, that's very unique to individuals in the martial arts is, um, over the years, you wind up seeing, um, some crazy shit that happens in the studio, in the gym, there are stories that are in um, are from the dojo that most people would never even know about unless they were there. And it's always something different with everybody, but everybody who's been doing this for at least 10 years has at least one of these stories. So it could be funny. It could be weird, but I was just wondering if you had one of these stories from the dojo, maybe you'd like to tell. Oh God, you really got me thinking now. Um, From the dojo. Let me go back to it. Let okay. me go back to it. I can't think of anything straight off the, straight off the top, but I will go back to it. Before the, this session ends, I'll, I will think of something. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Like, you know, it's, I know that it, it kind of puts you on the spot there because, like, you know, like I, I've had definitely some crazy shit that's happened before. Um, in the in the studio and things like that, and uh, you know, one I just while you're thinking about yours, I figured out maybe I'll just tell one of mine, just kind of get your brain racked. But um, I remember we were we had a uh, the karate school that I used to train at. We had a sparring night, and every Thursday was designated sparring night. So it was it was during regular class hours, so that way people wouldn't dip out of sparring and stuff like that. So we um we always had a full house, and for you know we in the adult program we had a kid. And his name was Daniel and he was 16 years old, but the kid was huge. He was bigger than me. I mean, he was a big kid. He didn't need to be in there with the little kids. He needed to be with the adults for size purposes and safety for everybody else's, but he was still a kid. He's 16. And um, so we were all sparring or whatever. And we had a guy come in for uh, to pay a mat fee. He's just paid his 20 bucks for a mat fee. He came in and trained for the night or whatever. I had never met this dude in my life, but he seemed cool, you know, like, but he came on a sparring night. So, kind of puts up some alarms, you know, you got to make sure that everybody's cool. Well, um, he winds up sparring cause we were doing rounds. So we do like three minute rounds, rotate three minute rounds, rotate. And, uh, he winds up sparring this kid. And as I'm sparring, which is like maybe 50%, like if that just flow sparring, real relaxed, everybody's having a good time. And, uh, I start hearing like somebody's hitting a heavy bag. So I looked over and it's that dude hitting this kid. And so, I went over and I'm like, hey, dude, you know, just let you know he's a kid. I know he looks like an adult, like, but let's kind of calm it down just a little bit. So needless to say, the couple more rounds go by and he winds up going back to that kid. Now, he didn't do this with anyone else. None of the adults he did this to. But when he got to the kid, he starts wailing on him again. So I go over to him like, hey, dude, I think you need to stop. Like you're you're hitting him really hard. And at this time, the first time he was real cool. But the second time he was kind of a dick and he was like, oh. Well, I fight you that way instead. And in my head, I'm going, all right, well, fuck it. <laughs> so I, I was like, okay. So we touch gloves and um, we're moving around or whatever. And he wind up creating way too much distance. And so I was like, all right, I kind of wanted to hit the shit out of this dude anyway for hitting this kid. So I crossing side kicked him old school, Bruce Lee style crossing side kicked him and hit him square in the chest. And he flies back and he winds up landing in the drywall. So much th so through the drywall, it was a shitty wall, so I'm not going to say it was a great kick, but so much so through the drywall that his ass went out of the drywall into the laundromat next door. <laughs> and so he winds up, after being such a dick and trying to beat this kid up, he doesn't say a word. He peels himself out of the drywall. He grabs his stuff, and he leaves. Never saw the guy again anywhere. It was the strangest thing. He just It looked like he came in just to beat the kid up. And then he came in and he thought he was going to beat me up. And I've been beaten up before, but it wasn't by that good, you know. But that's just that's just something that happened to me back in the day. It always stuck in my head, you know. You know, you, we, we, we get them all the time. It's funny you say that. And perhaps the guy I'm about to speak about right now, you're probably well aware of who I'm going to speak about, Hector Lombard. Yes, yes. Now, Hector, look, Hector Lombard, you know, from Cuba, uh, made the judo, uh, the Olympic judo team over there. Great judo guy, let me tell you. When he was back in Australia, he used to train out of my camp. Uh, and I was getting ready 
for an MMA fight against Heath Herring at the time, when Heath Herring was still with UFC, uh, or just come out of UFC, actually. And um, sorry, Pride. I must admit, sorry, not, not UFC, Pride. And, um, and Hector was a very, very good wrestler and also a great judo technician. And I thought, if I could get away from Hector shooting at me and sprawl, I'll get away from uh, Heath Herring. He can't stand a chance. I, I, I uh, instructed one of my, my coaches to bring he, Hector Lombard into our camps, which he did. And Hector was a really nice guy, tough, traditional type training, um, hardcore. The only thing with Hector was this. Even though he was a nice guy, he just could not pull anything. Basically, if he had an arm bar, he'd crank that arm bar. If he had a choke, he'd pull the choke. Um, he'd pull it nice and hard. If he was going to crack you, he'd crack you at 100%. There was no such thing as let's go 80% or let's go 70% and get 10 rounds. It was, everything was about that one round, let's go hard. And it was because of his gas tank also. And this went on for months and months and months. And I used to say to Hector, Hector, you're hurting the boys. you know. And Hector's renowned. I, I've known a lot of, um, a lot of uh, gyms around the world who state that every time he comes around, he tends to hurt people. you know. So I remember you know, after a few months, I said, Hector, you need to pull up <clears throat> a bit on your... Um, on your sparring. He goes, oh, brother, you know, this is the real stuff and, you know, we, we've got to practice the way we fight and so on. I said, yeah, but within reason. I said, because what's going to happen is we're going to lose all our sparring partners. No one wants to come back. You know, you're going to fuck things up and you're going to give people a false sense of security. They don't want to come back. If they're going to get hurt, not everyone's here to fight. If there's people that are here to help, the people that are here for just for our own well-being, and then there's people that want to fight. But not every, you can't put everyone in the same category. And he says, well, that's not what I'm about. I said, Hector, you need to calm down. Anyway, this went on and on and on. And um, I was one guy who wouldn't let him get away with it. Anyway, one particular day, we're, we're, we're sparring. It was about three weeks out of my fight. And um, he was in the ring and I was on the outside waiting to go in. And he's sparring a few of my boys. And he's just unloading, absolutely unloading on my boys. My boys are turning around saying, oh, look, I can't do the next round. I'm sore. And I, from the, from the corner, be saying, guys, pull up. You know, pull up a little bit because my theory is let's get 10 rounds rather than get one round. You know, let, let's make it work. Um, he wouldn't pull the pin. So I stepped in and I gave him an absolute bath. I stood there and I said, come and trade if you want to trade. And he was he was a strong boy. And I just traded with him, unloaded on him, everything I could. And at the end of that round, it was his turn to rest. And he went out of the ring, sat on the ground, grabbed his, grabbed his, um, his backpack and he was ruffling through it. And I said to him, you're in next again. And he just nodded his head. I continued sparring. By the time I finished that round, I had a look and he was gone. Never saw him ever again. And this went on for years. Yeah, we never spoke for years. And up until um, uh, when Holly Holmes fought uh, Ronda Rousey in Australia, I got together with him and Valerie Trouble. And we had dinner and we spoke about that incident. And I just said, you know, you know, things like that sort of stick in my mind. I know you're not a bad guy, but you need to look after those that look after you too. You know, you know, training, getting ready for a fight, it's about being a family. It's not about breaking and killing each other. You can do that to a stranger, but not to your own guys, you know. They're the guys that look after you. And he sort of nodded his head then. But it was quite interesting that um, that's all he knew. But going back, it was traditional stuff from Cuba, the, you know, the judo team and the way he trained with wrestling, and that was it. You know, when you're coming from a, from a, from a country that, they didn't have a lot. Um, only the best survived, and it was cutthroat. And that was his upbringing. So, I, you know, when I look back, I don't blame him now for what he did, you know. But then I did because I didn't know any better. But when I got to know him more and more, it was, it was quite interesting um, yeah, that uh, that's why he was doing what he did. He, he had no he, – he, all he had was top gear. He'd never had a, a second gear, you know. Yeah, that's but, very uh, interesting. Yeah, like, very. Guess, and there's a few yeah. guys that go like that. And, you know, I always try to give people the benefit of the doubt on their first couple days, their first weeks, first months of training, especially with sparring, if they're even allowed to spar, depending on the gym, because every gym has different rules about sparring. Um, but I always try to give people the benefit of that doubt, you know, like, hey, maybe they don't know that they're doing what they're doing. You know, they don't know their strength. Maybe it's they're young in the game. Um but I'll be damned. I after like warning number two, like that's all you're getting from me because I'm not letting you knock me out. Like I'm sorry. Like <laughs> either I need to stop sparring you because you are going to hurt me, 
or I need to step up my game and get you back. Like it's one or the other. Like I have no shame in saying someone will beat me. Like I've had to bow out before. Like some guys who just go hundred percent. I'm like, Hey dude, I'm out. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to go over here and spar this guy now or hit this bag. Like I have no shame in that. Cause I'm going to being, train tomorrow. <laughs> it's about being smart. You, you can't afford to let your ego get involved because your ego will get you hurt eventually. Um, but as we say, we've both been talking about it. There is certain people that go out to certain gyms and that's all they, they want to make. Um, and I've seen some of those people get exact people who thought they were tough go to a gym and walk out with their fucking tail between their legs. And you've got to laugh. <laughs> yeah, man. You've got to Especially laugh. what I always find funny is like traditional gyms, you know, because a lot of guys nowadays, these guys who, um, who have only been, which is a fascinates me that this is even a fucking thing that they've only been to MMA gyms. They've never taken a traditional art in their life. They've never done a traditional boxing class. They've never taken a kickboxing class. They've never done karate. They've never done Taekwondo. They've only been at Steve's MMA gym and all you can eat Chinese food emporium. And then so they come out and they just go start looking for fights because they think that traditional arts are McDojo's and then they get kicked in the fucking face and they go, I didn't learn that. Well, that's because your coach doesn't have a black belt and shit. He doesn't. He never learned an art. He's just regurgitating shit that Joe Rogan said ten years ago. Like he doesn't actually know what he's doing. You know, they ride that coattail of the name MMA. It just blows my mind. Yeah. Hey, you got, you got to tell me where the hell did you get all that footage from on your <laughs> on your side on McDojo? Fuck, I've got to sit there and I've got to scratch my head and and laugh. I mean, especially coming from a traditional background and yourself too. Uh, when I look at stuff like that, I just can't believe um, um, what's happening in the world of martial arts. Well, you know, you what's know? crazy is like a lot of the martial arts, you know, eventually there's a hierarchy. There's almost always a hierarchy. There's a, the, the master or grandmaster, depending on your style. And then it trickles its way down. And, um, you know, when you look at like the, the Gracie family, you know, their hierarchy starts at realism. Like, okay, we're going to battle test this your entire life, you know, and like, you're going to get all this shit and die. And then your son's going to battle test this his entire life. You know, it's like ingrained in that family and that culture. Like we want to put this to the test. Right. But then you have like, for instance, I'll say Aikido. And then you look at these old videos of O sensei and he's knocking people around with his fingers in mind. And then you're like, well, and then that, what do you think? Why do you think Aikido has a bad name is because it's not, like deep ingrained in realism, this old crazy asshole was throwing people around with his mind years before anybody else decided that they were going to do it. You know, it's like, it's, it's a very power hungry, sick thing that's going on with those people. And, you know, like even more traditional arts, like Indonesian Salat, like one of their biggest organizations over there, they have their kids getting run over by trucks. Like that's a martial arts demonstration for some reason. And kids are getting hurt and killed because of this. It becomes a cult. Um, that's what it becomes. It becomes a cult. That's what we've got to be careful about, you know? Yeah. It's, um, it's scary because what's stopping, for instance, what's stopping me from convincing you that you have chi powers? And then what if I can convince you to knock, be knocked out with your mind, what then is stopping me from having you drink this Kool-Aid <laughs> or murder that guy over there for me? There's, there's yeah. nothing really stopping you after that because you've already mentally fucked people up. Like it's, and then of course, what really pisses me off more than that is the fact that it waters down what real martial artists do. Because if I have a thousand people who are doing bullshit and only have one guy who's doing something real, then what it happens is the standard is bullshit. And, and the one guy who's doing something real, they're like, ah, well, you, we're going to lump you in here with the bullshit too. It's like, what? I don't even I don't even hang out with these guys like <laughs> but it, it messes it up for everybody. And I don't think that those people should be allowed to not be called out and no one was calling them out. So fuck them. Somebody <laughs> should, you know, and um, I have no shame in that game. I have no problem at all. Like I've been challenged. Gun, uh, people have threatened to shoot me. I've had people threaten to come to my house and hurt people that I know. Like it's bits like I keep myself pretty on a tight lip with certain things because I'm one of these people is probably going to follow through, but you know what? Good, good. Because if they do follow through, it proves my point that they're crazy, dangerous assholes, you know? So I, I'll just, I'll keep fighting this fight for as long as it takes. And, you know, for instance, like yourself and you doing this interview and us chit chatting now 
helps that fight so much because it exposes people who are really legitimately good martial artists and the things that you had to go through and what you had to do to earn it. And it kind of shows people like, look, there's hard work and dedication and blood and sweat, and you had to earn this. It wasn't given in any sense of the word. And if you look at somebody who's just basically taking and taking and taking and never giving back, there's something wrong. You know, like the you, you're 350 pounds overweight, you're 35 years old and you're a grandmaster, but you never spar with your people and you never show people what you can do and you don't have any proof or evidence that you've ever done anything legitimate. You're a fucking fraud. And yeah. in my mind, you know, like they don't deserve a seat at the table. You know, I'm, I don't think I'm the end all be all. I am mediocre, mediocre at best. My, I have an amateur record, no professional fights. I never lie about a thing that I've ever done in the martial arts community. And I don't claim to be the best person in the world. I've done fucked up shit. I love to drink alcohol. I like to have a good time. Hell, I might even smoke some weed from time to time. But you know what? I won't lie about it. You know? A human, God damn it. That, exactly. Look, yeah, I, I, look, I tend to agree with you there, by all means. Um, and like I said to you, for me, you know, passing on in today's world, it's about me passing on my knowledge. And, you know, my upbringing through martial arts was very, very hard. Do I have any regrets? Hell no. I don't have one regret. The hardest time where I was on my knees, literally crying, crawling home, that I carried my bag, I was injured and everything. So I look back today and I think, thank Christ, thank God that that did happen to me because it made me realize and put things in perspective. You know, nothing was ever given to me. You know, my showdown when I went for my black belt, it took me six and a half years before I went for it. There was no shortcuts. Fuck, in today's world, you can get online and in 12 months you can have a black belt. Leave me the fuck out of it. Come on, guys. You know, where's that traditionalism? Where's that hardcore? Give me a reason, you know, why I should be so honourable. You know, that six and a half years for me when I went for my black belt, I was so honoured at the end to get it because it's all I ever wanted. But the funny thing was when I did get my black belt is where I fucking started to learn. That's where the learning process worked, not from white belt to black belt. It was with black belt. That's where I started to learn. That's what people fail to realize. They think that once you get your black belt, it's everything. No, once you get your black belt, motherfucker, that's where you start to learn. I every agree. learning process where everything that you've encapsulated over those six and a half years, you're able to teach and see if it really works out with the general public and, and your students, you know? And then you Well, move I think it teaches you a lot about yourself. Like when you have to. Uh you know, because there's there's a stigma. You know, you can be a great fighter. There are great fighters out there who are just terrible coaches. And there are great coaches who are terrible fighters. <laughs> you know, like, it, I agree with you. Um, you know, if I always like to look at certain standards. Like if you look at somebody like Freddie Roach, you know, like Freddie Roach, like wild card boxing, incredible coach, like mm. great coach. Uh, got Parkinson's disease. You know, like he fought, he had some fights, but, you know, he was never like the upper echelon best in the world. But yeah. he understands how to make somebody a better person, how to make them go from being like these street thug kids that he was helping to being world champion fighters and making them better. And if, and if you're better in the ring, that doesn't always correlate to be you being a better human being, but it damn sure helps. You know, it can't hurt you. You know, having that that uh, little bit of uh I guess you could say that resistance, you know, like, mm -hmm. oh, I want to be better. Okay, so does that guy in that other corner. Who's going to win? You know, like, you want to be better? You got to get through that guy first. But that guy's tough. Exactly. Now get out there and be somebody. You know, it's not like you can just walk through it and just get it. And I, it always just hurts my soul to no end that the martial arts has helped me so. I know it's cliche. I don't give a shit. But it's helped me so much be a better person and help me be a teacher. It helped me affect people's lives in a positive manner that when I see one of these crazy assholes taking advantage of people, I can't hold my tongue. And I've seen people go, you know what? Just leave them be, you know, people will realize they're crazy. No, the fuck they won't. It's you would hope they would, but they won't because these people are learning business tactics. They're learning how to sell things. They're learning about advertisement. They're learning about cult leadership and they're getting better at it every day. And meanwhile, the good gym only has one location. Meanwhile, these crazy bastards have 175 worldwide locations and you're going, I wonder why this is happening. Well, it's because you're ignoring it. You know, you're allowing it to flourish instead of going, that's bullshit. 
you know, like, because people who've never trained before don't really know any better. They don't know. They're just being doing what they were told to do, you know? Ah, I get it. I get heated about that shit. It just bothers me. <laughs> you're not saying anything wrong. Is In fact, everything is right in what you're saying, but it's, you know, we all look at it a bit differently. I'm on the same wavelength as you, so yeah, I understand <laughs> what you're saying. Well, I appreciate it. Um, no, but anyway, before we head out, um, we the hour flew by, man. Uh, like I didn't realize it was an hour until I just looked down. Uh, but I appreciate you coming on. And if you could do me a favor before you we head out, I just want you to plug yourself and whatever you have going on, whatever's coming up next, or where people can find you and learn more about what's going on with you. <laughs> Hey guys, if you want to know more about what I do, my website is www.sangreco.com.au. Um, follow my I'm a Fighter campaign also. I'm doing great things for um, for the world in general. Um, basically transfer my fighter's ethics into life and hopefully you can do exactly the same. And if there's anything I can do, check me out on social media, Sam Greco underscore K1 um, on Instagram and Twitter. Hey, man, thank you so much for being on. And if anybody has any questions for afterwards or whatever, feel free to send me a, a direct message. On Facebook, I don't tend to get to all my messages as quickly, but on Instagram, I will answer you within the month. <laughs> I, I get a lot of messages. But uh, thank you again for coming on. And uh, I'll have this up live, uh, up on our YouTube within the next couple of days, and then I'll share you that link and all that stuff. So, But thank you once thank again for coming in. Take care.